rescheduled, but uh, that might be good rather than risking the bride last Wednesday. So, um, so next month we've got uh, our meetup. It's going to be up at the U. Uh, it's it's most likely very very likely going to be at the research park up at the U. Um, and Andrew here will be talking to us about the new um, the documentation packages or yeah, that's stuff the that's come out of the documentation efforts that I've been doing. Awesome. So um, so that should be a really good one. Um, we got today uh, Candace Barrett from BYU um, speaking to us. Um, uh, Candace was started as a professor down at BYU um, when I Your last I, year, my yeah. last year yeah. there. So I didn't get, sadly didn't get to take any classes with <laughs> um, Candace, but um, <coughs> she is specialized in spatial statistics, uh, something that I personally wish I'd had more of. Um, maybe that's why you're here too, to get more introduction to that. So. Um, if you have any questions about future meetups or want to volunteer to present in a future meetup, you can go to the uh, GitHub page. It's just github.com forward slash slc dash rdg. So it's Salt Lake City RG basically. Um, if you create an issue on there, you can suggest a topic or you can With that, I'll turn the time over to Candace, and and then usually just go leave five ten minutes for questions. So. so maybe like until quarter two or yeah, ten two. Would be great. Okay, quarter two. Quarter two okay. Two. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I didn't ask yeah, that before. So let's welcome Candace. <laughs> Well, I appreciate Mark inviting me. It was um, good to put this together. Um, I don't actually often use our packages for spatial statistics, so this is kind of an um, uh, introduction to R and then a good learning opportunity for me to, I, I've done stuff in, in um, R packages for spatial statistics, and so that's what I've pulled together for you guys. Um, I did post a link to, this, to these slides online. I posted all of the data that I use is up on my, um, BYU has been using Box instead of like Dropbox, so up on my Box page so that you could download the, um, the R Markdown file and run this yourself. Some of the things I um, ran separately and then posted the um, kind of um, R output up to Box just because it takes a while to run, so then if you want to compile this, it <coughs> won't take so long. Um, so uh, just as kind of to give me a heads up on how, or to give me some idea of how much um, kind of introduction to spatial statistics I need to talk about. How many of you guys have heard of like a variogram? A little bit, okay. Okay, great, this, I think I've got hit this at the right level then. So you guys know more about R than I do. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, I do know a little bit about spatial statistics. So I'm gonna first talk about um, three types of spatial data. Then I'm gonna do some common spatial analyses in R, specifically prediction slash Krieging. And then, um, and then I'll, do a, I'll touch on accommodating large data. Um, I you know, have a feeling that many of you guys deal with um, a lot of, of data, and so I've touched on a couple of packages that um, some of my friends have worked on um, to accommodate big, big data, so hundreds of thousands of data, maybe not millions of data. So large-ish is what the ish is. <laughs> um, so the first type of data that I have here is uh, geostatistical point reference data. I think this is the most common. So what it is is you go out, you fix a point, and you measure data at that point. Um, so the location is um, fixed. This happens a lot in weather and environmental data. Um, here I've plotted, I'm gonna use this data as an example. Um, this is just PM 2.5 measurements. Um, the square root of PM 2.5 tends to be more normal, so I've plot, plotted the square root. Um, <coughs> um, this data, I just picked one. Um, we averaged it, we were using this for a different project, and so we averaged it for like two weeks of data. So that's why there's some NAs here, is because for that particular two weeks, we didn't have observations. Um, but you can see that, um, anyway, the measurements are scattered across the US. 
Um, so we'll look at that. Um, the other type of data um, that we're going to look at is aerial data. Um, aerial data is just counts across or measurements across an entire region. So this comes up a lot in health data um, where you're looking at like um, counts of, of cancer in a specific region or whatever by county um, or demographic data. Um, they have a lot of data by zip code or county in the U.S. Uh, this, sorry, this specific data is, this is Malawi, and um, this is like the percent injured in the last two weeks from when they took the survey um, is what we're looking at there, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, the third type of data that we're not going to spend a lot of time on is point pattern or point process data. This is where the location is random. So um, an occurrence of, so we have this RSV data and we actually had to simulate this. I'm sure you guys are aware of um, at least IHC people dealing with privacy. And so we simulated this given the data that, um, that we were looking at. Um, um, and just looking at this region in Norfolk um, and the occurrence of where an RSV case, an infant RSV case, pops up. Um, and um, yeah, so the location isn't, we don't go out and specifically look at the location to see if right here did a, um, did a child have RSV. We go out and we find out where, or the person reports where the RSV pops up. So the, the location is what's random, not the response. Although um, they also have marked, there's marked point pattern data where it course we have like covariates or, or variables that correspond to the random location. Um, so I highlighted the packages. Um, this page right here, it, let me see if it will even, yeah, it won't pop. Sorry, I don't have the internet here. I didn't think about that. Um, sorry. Um, so this page has a whole, so a whole description of all of the different bazillion packages that they have for spatial data. Um, whether you want to measure dependence or predict or um, model clustering with point pattern data, you can go to that webpage and it will tell you kind of um, uh, packages that you can use. Um, the packages that I'm going to use here are listed here. I've commented this one out because um, I needed to I need to load it later because it has a function that's the, that's the same as in this package. Anyway, that's why it's commented out here. I'll load it later. <laughs> um, so, and I've tried to comment so that if you guys are looking at these slides later to figure out what you want to use them for, you'll have kind of some idea of what the packages are used for. Um, certainly, um, we're going to touch on just a couple functions in each of the packages, but many of the packages have a lot more functions that they can use. Um, I used I did include this just as an FYI, what I use for plotting. I'm sure you guys have much, a much broader <laughs> um, knowledge of the best packages to use for plotting things. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, spatial prediction, or what they call Krieging. Um, Krieging does have a specific definition, but nowadays it's just used to mean prediction. Um, and so that's, I'm using it loosely here to mean prediction. Um, <clears throat> So when we're Krieging, we make use of Gaussian processes to predict at unobserved locations. Um, we're going to interpolate, but rather than interpolating linearly, right, taking two points and then just kind of averaging between the two as we go, um, we want to model that using dependence, this um, covariance structure. Um, and then the other thing, right, with statistical models is that we get to model the uncertainty as well. Um, so, but how do we model that spatial dependence? How do I model the degree to which I'm gonna, um, so if I have two points, this point should be more similar to this point, but how, by how much, right? And so we expect that values close to one another would be more similar than values that are far apart measurements. And so because of that, two points that are really close to each other are gonna be really highly correlated. But then um, as we go farther away, so more correlated, which means smaller variance, and then the farther away they get, they'll be less correlated, which means larger variance. Okay. And then at some point, that variance levels off. So it doesn't matter. The, the temperature here in Salt Lake and the temperature in Florida are just as uncorrelated as the temperature in here and the temperature in Puerto Rico, even though it's farther away, right? They aren't correlated. 
some correlation, I don't know. <laughs> um, some common assumptions that we make is um, stationarity, so that um, locations that are h distance apart, no matter where I am in the space that I'm interested in, they have the same correlation, these two points have the same correlation as these two points, okay? Um, and then isotropy means the distance is the, um, or sorry, the direction, so that these two points have the same correlation as those two points, okay? Now, there are plenty of cases where these assumptions aren't going to be met, um, and I'm not going to focus a ton on that. A lot of the packages that we end up using end up accounting for, um, just by default of the methods they're using, account for non-stationarity and anisotropy. So, um, non, when these aren't, assumptions aren't met. But they're the basic kind of um, assumptions that we're going to make when I'm looking at the equations. <coughs> Um, so a very general spatial model. I've tried to write it out generally so we can talk about it in a different couple of contexts. But why is the response that we're measuring? Mu is some mean process. It could be a regression or it could just be a constant mean um, observed at location SI. And then omega I is going to be my spatial noise, my spatial dependence. And then epsilon I is going to be some random noise. Um, sometimes we don't um, we don't include this random noise, we just think that all the noise, um, or we don't think it, but we model it with just, um, just our spatial Gaussian process noise, but um, I've included both of them here. Uh, so we're going to model our omega then has a mean zero and then some spatial dependence. And then how we pick this dependence structure um, is what I'm going to talk about next. Um, so the classical approach to picking that dependent structure is to compute a variogram. Um, certainly there are a lot of ways you can do this. Um, kind of as a modeler, this is a nice way to do it because we have um, some support that says the, the dependent structure that I've chosen and fit is the best for um, my data. So um, the empirical semi-variance, um, they model it's an empirical variogram, but we model half of the variogram, and so we call it semivariance um, because it has better fitting properties. Um, <laughs> we take all we take our data, all points that are h apart. So all of my points in my um, PM 2.5 data. Let me go back here. So all points that are this distance apart. Uh, here maybe here, right? We take all of those and then we compute the squared difference between them. And we do that for a lot of different distances. Um, so the measurement at those two points and we square those. And then we take the average of them and divide it by two. Okay, so all points h distance apart, we average them and divide by two. And then we do that for a lot of different distances. Okay, and so what I'm looking at is the very it's this variance type thing um, at different distances apart. And so what we want to see is that as distance gets farther, my variance increases, right? And then it levels off at some point, okay? Um, so here, just some, um, I think part of what I wanted to do with this was expose you to language that um, is used in those packages. So if you go to use a package, you'll be familiar with what those terms mean. So um, the first term here is this nugget. Now that's going to be the variance of that epsilon, that random noise, that I can take two measurements at the same location and they won't be exactly the same. There'll be some variance between the two. That's a pretty common assumption, um, but certainly there are reasons maybe not to include a nugget. Sometimes um, estimation or, or fitting can be kind of problematic to fit the nugget as well. Um, the sill is kind of where the variance levels off. Um, this is going to be called, um, in the, let's see, the nugget is called tau squared in most packages, and the sill is sigma squared in most packages. Um, and then the range is where, um, where our variance levels off at. So um, this particular um, function or dependence structure is called an exponential, but there are several. 
So this one is the exponential. Um, if you've heard of the Matern correlation structures, Matern can be quite flexible. They have this extra um, parameter called kappa. And if you set kappa equal to 0.5, then you get the exponential. <laughs> I think it's um, a lot of people actually do this. They say, oh, I'm using the Matern because it's so flexible. And then they set kappa equal to 0.5. But really, it's just the exponential when they do that. And they know that, but they're trying to sound like they are being more flexible than they are. OK. <laughs> the matern, um, that one's our dashed line right here. This is our Gaussian. And so um, it's a lot smoother process. So the dependence will last a lot longer. Okay. Um, the spherical is another common one. Um, and it so the decay happens quite rapidly. And so the, the um, range, your spatial dependence range won't, range won't last as long. Um, the wave, I've never seen it used, but I think it's a fun function for dependence that you have um, strong dependence here and then weak dependence and then you get a little bit more dependence. So kind of how I picture where this wave one might come into play is if you're looking across the United States, right, you, you come into mountains and so that might, you know, decay the, make more variance and then increase the variance again when you get over the mountains. I don't know, um, but it's a, it's a fun function so I included it. <laughs> Um, all right, certainly also you can, um, you can use, um, just compute the empirical co variance covariance function between all the locations. If all you're interested in doing is predicting at locations you have observations, that's fine. Um, but if you don't have observations, you need something to model that dependence at unobserved locations. All right, so this is um, the, the package GOR. And um, the data I'm using is this, um, is the PM 2.5 data. Um, and so, let's see, I had to cut out, there's some observations that are in Alaska and Hawaii. So I've cut out Alaska and Hawaii there. And then, um, so this variog function is gonna compute the variogram, um, but you have to give it a geodata object. And all it is is the, um, the response, so square root of my pollution data, and then um, coordinates. Let's see, this three, I've just picked a specific day or a specific time period that I've looked at. That's all the three is. Um, and then my coordinates um, for three because um, it wants longitude, latitude, and latitude is listed, listed first in my data there. Okay, so then variog, option bin, all that's doing is saying I'm, try I'm, I'm binning those. So um, I'm going to take the average of all of those locations that are h distance apart. Okay. And then estimator type, classical, there's a couple others. Um, so Noel Cressy is the big, there's, a, there's two big spatial guys, um, Noel Cressy and Michael Stein. And Noel Cressy wrote, um, wrote the book on, spat on classical spatial statistics. And so um, he has another one, a modulus, I think is what it's called. Um, I, I did try both of them for this data and they looked very similar, so I just stuck with classical. <laughs> There's so much data here that it doesn't matter. There's, um, anyway, so a couple thousand data points, I think. Um, and then plot the variogram. Now this isn't, um, this, Anyway, I'm going to show you guys. This isn't great. So we can see that we just keep increasing. And usually when you just keep increasing in your variogram, it means that you don't have a fine enough distance. So you haven't, um, you either don't have data that's at fine enough distance or you've binned too much. You've, you've made your groupings too big. So um, I've printed out the variogram. Um, so U is the midpoint of all of the H's that I'm looking at when I bin it, okay? So all of those H's, the midpoint of that first one was 2.17 of those distances, and then um, 6.53, et cetera. So you can see it corresponds to where I'm plotting this radiogram. Um, v is what was computed, the variance, so it's the y-axis. And then this n says how many of those pairs are in this clustering here with the midpoint 2.17. And this one has 45,000 um, 
<laughs> pairs of points. So we have t a ton of data here, and so we can probably, rather than take the default um, breaks that they've done to bin this, um, we can actually change the binning. And so um, it shows you the standard deviation, the bin limits. Um, I'm not sure what the indicator is for. Sorry about that. There's more that didn't get printed. So instead of taking the default, I'm um, changing my UVEC to um, have 100 breaks in it. Um, and then you can see we're leveling off here, and then we're increasing again. Now this is an artifact of the smaller sample sizes in those pairs now. So here I've printed out the N here. And so you can see this point right here only has two pairs I'm averaging over, right? And as statisticians, right, at we need at least 30. So <laughs> I want to cut off maybe these ones. Um, in practice, it's common to take the first half. Um, and so maybe, maybe something that would have even been better is to make a finer scale and then, um, and then cut off the distance at 25 or something. What I've done instead is I've just stuck with this one and then um, only am using like up until this point to estimate. So I use the first 80% <coughs> Um, as my variogram. Okay. Any questions so far as I'm, all right. So this looks like something that is more what we'd expect. Now certainly it's not, probably still not the best um, thing that we could do, but it's giving you an idea of what you can look at as you're looking at your own data and creating your own data. Um, let's see. So to change my maximum distance from the, the actual, maximal, act, actual maximum distance between two points, um, so that point between maybe Southern California and Maine, <laughs> right? Um, you just use the max.dist argument, and I've just made it 80% of the maximum distance. All right. So there are two ways, and I'm sorry this got cut off right here. Um, I noticed that last second that you can fit the variogram. Um, so vario fit uses least squares to fit this, and then like fit uses maximum likelihood. They both give similar, um, especially for such large data, they both give similar estimates, but there are two ways. So you can use vario fit argument or like fit, um, both of them in the GOR package. This is the um, default fit with the exponential covariance. Um, I did give it some initial pr um, covariance parameters that, that seemed reasonable to me. So the range is 30. For the exponential covariance, um, the, the um, let's see, the, ra the range parameter, that phi parameter in there, is one third of the range. So that's why I started it at 10. Um, and then I did fix the nugget here so that it would come down here. You'll see um, on the next slide, I have a couple of um, covariance functions where I didn't fix the nugget, so it estimates that nugget. Um, but it wasn't bringing it down enough, and I think that's because my bins were too big. I think had I had smaller bins, it would have brought it down a little bit more. Um, but um, plot the variogram and then lines, so it has some nice automatic functions to do, so you can plot the variogram with. Um, here are my estimates, so it's, it's fixing my nugget, 0.1, my tau squared. Sigma squared is my sill, so kind of where the variance levels off for the rest of the, um, for the spatial dependence. And then my phi is that range parameter for the exponential covariance and 11.3. So, um, it can be kind of sensitive to starting values it, as, in as much as it wouldn't converge if you had terrible starting values. And so they have default, you don't have to give it initial starting values, but it's kind of nice to, to do it. It gets you, it gets it going at least. <laughs> um, if you don't give it initial covariance parameters, it'll take the default and then it might not work. And so it's nice just to start by giving it. Um, I fit three others, so I did fit the wave just for fun, that's the pink line, um, the spherical. So the exponential without the fixed nugget does start right here, but I liked having it come down um, 
here, but the spherical, all of these are about the same. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the Gaussian, but I would do spherical or exponential in this case. <clears throat> let's see. So the next, let's go to this slide. So this slide has the Krieging. It can take a little while, um, but <laughs> it, I mean, when I say a little while, I mean like 30 seconds, which is just annoying when you're compiling slides, right? So <laughs> um, not, it's not that long, um, but I have, so what I've done is I've predicted on a 200 by 200 grid. So I'm predicting to 400 locations, um, and then krieg.com, and I'm not actually sure what that com stands for, um, off the top of my head, is you give it the, um, the geodata object, so that was the object we created to make the variogram. The location, so this is the, my grid of locations I wanna predict at. Um, this krieg takes an object from krieg.control, and then all, so it has a bunch of things you can put in here. What I've put in here is my fit of the exponential covariance, okay? And this is the one with the fixed nugget. Um, and then this is my plots. So this is the predicted um, PM 2.5, and then the standard error. Um, let's see, I'll show you, let me just point out the objects that are giving us that. Um, Casey, so Krieg.ver is giving me my variance and um, Casey dollar sign predict is giving me my predictions. Um, so, I mean, we're seeing, right, that PM 2.5 is large in cities. Basically, we've got Chicago, um, LA, San Francisco area, and New York. So, not super surprising. The Midwest has low values of PM 2.5. Um, so let's see, you can see the variance is big out here. There are ways to um, set a window so that you don't predict at locations that you don't care about, like the Pacific Ocean. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just, I just left it. I think it's nice to see what, um, how the variance is working, right, for, for locations where we don't have data. No data here, and so the variance is a lot bigger. Um, locations where we have data was in the cities here, and so our variance is a lot smaller. Um, so uh, one thing that is actually really common is that you'll see linear trends. You'll see that at the more north you get, you know, um, the larger it gets, or the more north you get, the smaller it gets, or the farther east you get, the larger it gets, et cetera. Like, so you'll see these trends in space, and so um, they have these options in your krieg.control when you're predicting or fitting the variogram. And so to account for um, a longitude and latitude effect or a northern or eastern effect, um, this data doesn't really have, maybe, you could, maybe we should fit a spline there, but it doesn't really have that correlation we would expect to see if, if it were a problem. I fit it here just to show you guys that you can. Um, but what you would wanna do is say, okay, trend.d would be first. Um, first means that um, I'm just going to have a linear effect on longitude and a linear effect on latitude. Second means I'm going to include an interaction between those two. So just our first and second order um, trends. And then trend.l is um, predicting a, the trend that you would want to use for predictions. Okay. Um, I did include, so this is that, these are the predictions using um, longitude and latitude as covariates. I used just the first order trend, and then I plotted the difference between ordinary Krieging, so that was the first plot, the first picture. So it's this picture minus the universal Krieging, so minus this one, and here's the difference. And you can see there's some difference. They're pretty small, though, so the scale for the square root of PM 2.5 is two to 4.6. So this difference is pretty small. Um, but just as a heads up that you can account for that using these functions. 
Um, so GOR also has a krieg.bayes function. Um, if you want to take a Bayesian approach um, using, using GOR, I'm going to show you a different package for Bayesian um, <coughs> modeling or Bayesian krieging. Um, you can only model the dependence for range over which you have data. So sometimes you'll see um, those variograms just increase, increase, and increase. And really what you're seeing is I don't have data that's fine, close enough together to capture what's really going on. So PM 2.5 actually doesn't have that big of a range. Um, it actually tends to die off. Um, I can't remember what my um, colleague said, but, but it's, you know, it's really concentrated around the roads. And so, um, and so probably we've not fit the best model. They have um, land use regression models that account for like urban um, and things like that. And um, that's actually what we did to predict that data um, rather than just using neighboring observations to predict it. Um, let's see, you can always account for more trends. Um, so um, a lot of times when we don't see stationarity, when I don't see the variance staying the same across a region of interest, it's because of covariates. And so if you account for covariates, you can get down to a um, dependent structure that is stationary, um, which is nice. Um, OK, so spatial regression. If I want to do this using GOR, they don't actually have a um, so the function doesn't automatically fit a regression. And so what you have to do is first, um, first fit your regression and estimate beta hat, and then compute the residuals. And then do your spatial dependence on the residuals. So um, create a variogram on the residuals, estimate the variogram parameters. And then you're going to create a regression model using this trend.spatial function in GOR. And um, that's just the the same way that you do other trends in linear in our linear models. And then you would do the krieg.conv with the my trend in trend.d and trend.l. Okay. So I'm going to use actually a different package, and we're going to do Bayesian spatial regression for this next data set. So I have temperatures um, across Utah. Um, when I predicted, I just predicted on the range of the data. So we're going to cut out some of Utah uh, in our predictions just as a heads up. <laughs> but I'm going to predict over that region. Um, you can see that um, you know, we've got higher temperatures here, some low temperatures here, um, et cetera. This is October 10th, 2009. Again, I just picked a day. Um, elevation is sometimes related to temperature. As we know, if we hike up in the mountain, it gets a little colder. So um, I'm going to use elevation as a regressor. So the function that we're going to use is SP Bayes. This is from the um, package SP Bayes. Sorry, the function I'm using is um, SPLM. So just fit a linear model, um, and it assumes um, that you're going to use conjugate priors, and so it gives the it does have a couple of other options for your priors, um, but really what this wants is just the parameters for your priors. So tau squared, again, is the nugget, right? So tau squared was the nugget in GOR, and so the author of this package has tried to keep it similar to that. So tau squared is your nugget. Um, sigma squared is the, um, uh, the variance parameter for your spatial dependence, and then phi is um, the range parameter, and it, it uses a uniform. Um, yeah. um, and iters, number of posterior draws, your starting values um, for the MCMC tuning parameters, and then the actual model. The model is, um, so I've used elevation, and then I've used latitude and longitude, um, or longitude and latitude as covariates. Um, so here I've just plot plotted the, the theta or the covariance parameters, the trace plots of those to make sure that we're converging. Um, beta, the, the posteriors are conjugate normal, and so, um, so, I, so they don't automatically plot those. They just plot the trace plots of the parameters that would maybe not have converged. <coughs> we're doing OK. Um, OK, then to actually estimate my coefficients, so you can predict from that without um, 
without having to look at even your coefficients. But I wanted to look at the coefficients and see what those looked like. Um, so you have to use this function sp recover. Um, this is the model I just fit, that MCMC object. And then the starting object for the, for the value I want to look at. So you'll see I didn't actually converge right away. Um, this tau squared took a while to get in into kind of its um, posterior distribution. Um, so I started at the 10,000th iteration, and then I took every hundredth. This, so if, you know, if you've heard many Bayesian statisticians talk about thinning, it's the worst thing ever, but it's very nice for um, computational purposes. So, <laughs> so I have thinned <laughs> to every 100. Um, and then just for labeling, I gave the covariance, um, or sorry, the covariate names there. Um, so you can see our intercept um, is, has a huge range. Elevation actually does seem to be significant um, in a Bayesian significant sense. Um, and then longitude and latitude. Um, zero is right here and zero is right here. So longitude, latitude maybe aren't that important, but um, elevation, depending on the spatial statistician you talk to, you should just always account for longitude and latitude effect. I don't know. That might not be my, my thoughts, but some, some people do that. Um, and then you can use the object sp, pre SP predict. And you just plug in your um, object and then the prediction coordinates. So I've predicted on a 100, nope, nope. Where does it say prediction coordinates? Um, I must have had, I must not have something that I'm looking at. Anyway, I'm predicting on this grid here, um, <laughs> just like I would otherwise. And then I'm um, getting posterior samples starting at 10,000 and thinning every 100, just like before. Um, and then, so what I've got now, so this pred.temp is posterior draws from those location predictions. So um, posterior predictive distribution, right? So this would be draws from the posterior predictive distribution at each location. Um, and so I'm just plotting the mean here. This is the posterior mean, and this is the posterior standard deviation. Um, the mean ranges from 10 to negative 15, and the standard goes all the way up to 10, standard deviation. So um, certainly we're not doing the best that we probably could here. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway. But, oh, the location, this is where we have data, right? So where the standard deviation is really low, we have data there at those locations. Oh, one other thing is I automatically fit here an exponential covariance. And I didn't do a variogram, I just fit the exponential. So, um, you know, probably we could, maybe could have done better had we looked at the variogram for that one. Um, some SP Bayes notes. So if you don't have normal data, you can use a GLM. That function works really well. Um, multivariate linear model, um, multivariate GLM, uh, misaligned data. So sometimes you have um, data that are observed at one location and you want to match them to data that are observed close to that location. So a misaligned object. Um, a dynamic linear model for spatiotemporal data. Um, this, yeah. <laughs> Um, tuning obviously can be a pain, just like any other Bayesian model, but um, certainly, yeah, it's nice. This package specifically is optimized for speed. Um, RAMPS is another package for Bayesian spatial models. I didn't include it just because this is the one that I would use. So, All right, we've got five minutes left. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover this and then I'll just briefly talk about the large data at the end. So for um, aerial data where we have counts over a region or um, measurements over a region, um, instead of denoting our observations with some location SI, um, we just talk about region I, right? Um, and so in, instead of modeling this sigma, using a variogram, we don't have specific locations to take um, 
correlation of dis using distance, right? And so instead of using distance, we, um, we use this um, neighbor structure. So if you've used time series models, they do like AR1. And so we're going to use the same idea, these autoregressive models. Um, so here's my location of interest, then I'm going to consider anything that shares an edge a neighbor to it. And I'm going to um, predict based on these, conditionally based on these neighbors. Um, if you have a second order neighborhood structure, then I would also look at corners. Um, often our data aren't, aren't, um, <coughs> aren't on a grid, and so um, one way to define neighbors is we share a border or we um, yeah, share a border is maybe the common way. Um, K closest neighbors using centroids or um, this, um, any regions that are um, some specific distance apart based on their, their centroids are less than some distance apart. This is what I'm going to use for the Malawi data that we had looked at. Um, then what I do is I say my, my location, my open dot circle, conditioned on these locations with the closed dot circles, has a normal distribution that's some weighted average over those observations. Okay. And then some variance. Um, this weighted average is usually um, some correlation value, rho, um, and then um, where one, so, so divided by one if it's a neighbor, or sorry, times by one if it's its neighbor, divided by the total number of its neighbors. So um, just this weighted average. And then the variance is usually some common variance among all the locations divided by the number of its neighbors. So this is the SPDEP package. Um, I didn't write that up here, but um, the SPDEP package um, helps us define our um, neighborhood structures. Um, I removed these because we don't have, one is like the entire country and another one represents an island for which we don't have, um, two, two locations for which we don't have um, data for. So that's why these are getting taken out there. Um, so D near nay is an object that's saying, um, I'm going to look at longitude and, oh, I'm so sorry, this got cut off, longitude and latitude and then all locations that are some distance less than um, that apart. This is longitude and latitude of the center, centroid of the region are going to be neighbors. And then, um, so here's, I wanted to plot Malawi so you could see it. I could not figure out how to plot Malawi on top of my neighborhood object. Um, <laughs> but here's my neighborhood object where you can see this guy's neighbor is this one. Um, and it's um, bi-directional. So, so this guy's neighbor are these two neighbors. This guy's neighbor is, are these two neighbors. This guy's neighbor is that one. But this guy's neighbors are this one, this one, and this one, et cetera. Um, then um, when I'm going to fit my linear, my linear model, it wants a list, a neighborhood list. And so that's my NB, my neighborhood to a list W structure. And then I just fit my um, spatial auto linear model, so auto regressive linear model, um, using my, my response variable, all injured. And then I'm using these covariates, um, poverty, um, distance to school, food as a proportion of um, uh, income, um, mean house income, electricity, the proportion of houses in that area that have electricity. Um, my data structure, my list, my neighborhood structure, and then the family I'm using. So car is really common um, to use. Yeah, there's also SAR. Um, here's my observed data, the fitted values, and then I plotted the residuals. Um, Um, so one thing about conditional models is you can't predict at unobserved locations unless you've included them in the model because I'm conditioning on my neighbors, right? So um, a Bayesian approach actually is a nice approach for a conditionally autoregressive model um, because this, the conditionality, the estimation for unobserved locations using that conditionality um, falls kind of nicely from a Bayesian structure. Um, other um, 
other packages that are good for aerial data, specifically for non-Gaussian aerial data, is this SPAM package and NG spatial, um, non-Gaussian spatial. Um, this non-Gaussian spatial actually accounts for confounding, so between um, the covariates and spatial dependence. So a lot of the covariates are also also have spatial structure to them, and so you'll see that your coefficients aren't aren't significant, even though they are. But it's just a um, a fact of the coefficients um, um, being correlated with the uh, spatial dependence. Um, I'm going to skip the point pattern data. It's not very helpful anyway. Um, Large-ish data. It's um, so fixed rank Krieging. So we reduce the rank. I'm going to let you guys look at this and then just highlight. So I did fixed rank Krieging. Oh, sorry. Here's our observed. Um, I pulled this large data out of this lattice, or sorry, the fixed rank Krieging package. Lattice Krieging is um, a little bit easier to use. Um, Doug Nitschka wrote it, and so it's anyway. He's he's more of a computing guy than Noel is, who wrote the fixed rank Krieging package. Um, and you can see it's quite smooth. Our predictions are actually quite smooth across the Earth, which may or may not be real. Um, nearest neighbor Gaussian process. So this method and then methods that are similar to it are kind of the most recent way to handle large data. Um, it's, written, it's, it's written by the same person that wrote the um, SP, it's not even, it's SP Bayes package. The SPLM function is what we we're using. Um, and so it's written very similarly to that. Um, you would do, it's the same arguments, basically. Um, and here are the predicted here. This one's noisier. What I plotted here was one, one criticism of reduced rank methods, like the fixed rank Krieging or the lattice Krieging, is that they're too smooth, um, too smooth for what we would actually observe. Um, but the nearest neighbor Gaussian process allows for um, less smoothness. Um, Matthias Katzfuss has done a little bit more on this um, conditionally um, handling large data. Um, all right, so this was just a very brief overview, a very like topical overview, I guess, of um, prediction in for spatial objects. I didn't even give you guys like the best prediction, right? It was just here's how you would predict. Um, but hopefully I've given you guys methods for how you can look into um, some better predictions. Certainly there's always going to be, um, you know, depending on the time you can spend on it, the money you can put into it, there's always going to be a better approach, right? Um, uh, but anyway, but this kind of gives you at least a starting point for if you're going to head out and do some spatial prediction. Um, certainly, just like with any model, any even regression model, right, there's um, a give and take. Um, a lot of things are still being worked on. So some of my work that I've done is looking at um, predicting in a regression framework, but um, you don't actually have the regressors measured at these unobserved locations. And so how would you make use of those covariates still um, and still predict? Um, categorical data is kind of like my area handling um, this non-normal data, but specifically categorical, so um, unordered response for, um, categories. Um, these models actually are really not very easily identifiable, so trying to fit those can be a pain. Um, and then just accounting for spatial uncertainty. So that RSV data, we were given data of where an RSV, um, an infant had RSV, um, but we were only given it jittered within a one meter um, radius of where it was. Maybe it was, I can't remember, 300 meters? I don't remember what the jittering was. I think I'm not supposed to tell you anyway if I did know, so it's a good thing I can't remember it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we don't know, right, specifically exactly where that RSV location occurred, and so how do we account for that when we're trying to estimate um, how likely someone is at a location to have um, RSV? Anyway, um, I'm happy to chat with you guys. If you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer them. If you want to chat after a little bit, that's that would be great. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I was just curious, uh, I think it's probably already the answer to it, but so that first four points are actually rooted. When you don't have covariates, is the, what kind of methods are you using? 
Well, so what we tried to do was to break the region up. So um, break the region up into what? So the, I mean, there are a couple, right? So you can predict the covariate first. Usually covariates have spatial dependence. Um, what we were trying to do in our approach was to break up the, um, the region into places where the covariate would be similar and then predict just over that region and then combine the predictions um, using a Bayesian modeling average approach. Um, I think the more common approach is to predict um, but certainly that, that leaves out uncertainty. So predict the covariate first and then predict at those locations. But that anyway, leaves out uncertainty. Yeah? I was going to ask if when you showed your phase model, I noticed you had um, two sets of each of the parameters. Was that? Oh, um, <coughs> that those were the, the prior, prior parameters. Um, so it wasn't the parameters, it was the prior parameters. Sorry, let's see. And 30 is like 30. Okay. So the inverse gamma takes a range and a, um, sorry, a scale or shape, shape and scale, shape and range maybe. Oh, okay. So the two, the inverse gamma, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I well, so I use R for all of my stuff. I just don't use packages for it. Yeah. yeah. I write my own functions, <laughs> which you know is pros and cons too, right? I know exactly what it's doing, unless it's not doing what I want it to do, right? <laughs> then I then it's broken somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there, so at SAS has done a ton to build up their spatial stuff. Um, I don't. I haven't used SAS, so I don't know how um, user friendly it is for SAS users. Um, they. So, yeah. There's there's SAS. Um, yeah. Certainly, I have some colleagues that just go straight to like Python and Julia and um, that stuff. So I use a latent model, so a latent Gaussian model to look at that, and then you, so the, um, and then you cut it. I don't know why I'm going to that slide where it just says that. <laughs> and then, um, so then using that latent multivariate normal, um, then you cut it based on um, different um, criteria. So um, the the non-spatial kind of paper famous paper is May and Van Dyke. Um, Van Dyke does a lot of the categorical data for non-spatial models. There's a, if you, if you are interested in it, um, there is an MNP package, capital M, capital N, capital P, which is um, multivariate norm, no, I'm not sure, probit. So it's a probit function um, using this latent approach, MNP. But they don't have the spatial version yet. I've been working on it, but it's hard to estimate those parameters. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming and for being okay with well, I don't know if it's okay with the last minute change, but um, once again next month, the twenty first. March will be up at the U.